Okay, we'll wait a couple of seconds. Uh, still counting participants, but to those present already, I will start. My name is Jeroen Schouten. I'm an intensivist at Radboud University Medical Hospital, also chair at the ASCAP, the ASCMIT uh, study group on antimicrobial stewardship. And I'm welcoming you all this afternoon uh, on this webinar specifically uh, oriented at, um, at AMS in COVID times. And uh, very, very happy to have such large numbers of, uh, of participants this afternoon. And uh, we've, uh, we've prepared a, a nice program for you with four speakers uh, from different fields of expertise who will lead you through their work and uh, the current state of the art uh, literature on, on their specific topic. And um, um, I would suggest that we, we start going. Um, we have half an hour for, uh, for every speaker. Um, and that means that they have 20 minutes to talk. Uh, and then afterwards we have five to 10 minutes to discuss. And uh, as was already mentioned, um, uh, you can actually ask your question in the Q&A. That's the easiest way to do it. Uh, and then we will pick up uh, the um, uh, the questions in uh, in the time to be answered. So my co-chair for this evening uh, is uh, Jose Ramon Pano Pardo. Maybe Jose, you can shortly introduce yourself. Hi, uh, yes, I'm an infectious disease physician at Hospital Clinico in Zaragoza, Spain. I mainly work in the field of antimicrobial stewardship for inpatients, and I'm part of the uh, scientific program, ECMIT a scientific program, and I'm very glad as uh, Jerome to be chairing this webinar that uh, aims to, to deal with the topic of antimicrobial stewardship in this era, in this pandemic era, which is no easy. So I agree with Jerome. I think it's time to start and let's go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. And, and that's, uh, so it's time to introduce our first speaker and I'm, I'm very proud to, uh, to, to be able to announce Timothy Rawson. And Timothy is a clinical research fellow at uh, Imperial College in London. He has published uh, extensively on exactly what we're talking about on co-infections and uh, nosocomial infections, bacterial infections in COVID, and looked at uh, antibiotic use during that time and also looked at the impact on antimicrobial resistance. Um, so um, I'm very um, uh, eager to hear his story. Uh, uh, the title of his subject is How Important Are Bacterial Co-Infections and Secondary Nosocomial Infections in Individuals with COVID? So please, uh, Timothy, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, hopefully you can all see my slides. Um, and today what I've been asked to talk about is um, how important is bacterial infection in individuals with coronavirus? And for the purpose of the presentation today, I wanted to try and initially focus on some of the current data we have around bacterial infection in patients with COVID-19. I then wanted to move on and look a little bit at some of the common questions which keep arising and some of the unknowns which are still to be answered. And right to the end, if we have a little bit of time, I'd like to spend just a few moments thinking about how we can try and improve frameworks for the reporting of data around bacterial infections in patients with COVID-19 to try and help address some of these remaining uh, unknowns and outstanding questions. So going back to early in 2020, um, when the pandemic was beginning to become a real issue globally, there was the significant question of what uh, challenges were going to be posed for antimicrobial stewardship during this period of time. And thinking about the presentation of patients with coronavirus, we were seeing patients with clinical signs, clinical symptoms, laboratory parameters, and radiological findings, which could be consistent with bacterial infection. We had limited data on the rates of bacterial infection associated with COVID-19. And based on previous experience of respiratory viral pandemics, such as with influenza, there was a significant and I think justified perceived risk that often in, in influenza, at least, we saw association of high rates of bacterial respiratory infections and the association of these with high rates of mortality in patients. And over the last year, we've actually made significant steps in terms of trying to understand the, the role of bacterial infection in COVID-19, but it still remains quite difficult to truly define and characterize. 
Uh, we see lots of different uh, definitions, sometimes used interchangeably between co-infection, superinfection, secondary infection. Sometimes we discuss just respiratory uh, infections associated with COVID. Sometimes we also include non-respiratory infections. We've obviously looked at things like community and hospital acquired bacterial infection associated with COVID-19. And also have tried to address a number of the challenges, which I think still uh, are up there for debate namely being what is the sort of the direct attributable nature of bacterial infection and with secondary to COVID-19? Are these infections more simply a direct consequence of other interventions to support very sick patients with COVID, such as, for example, mechanical ventilation or central line use? Or are these being driven by changes in practice and pressure on healthcare? Or in fact, is it, is it a mix of all three above um, acting in, in slightly different ways? To date, what we have observed in terms of antimicrobial use, drug resistance and the impact of infection um, within COVID-19 is that in the community, overall, there have been reductions in the amount of antimicrobials being used and apparent reductions in notifications of bacterial infections. Within the hospital environment, we've seen reports of high rates of antimicrobial use and overall low rates of reported bacterial infection. Within the critical care setting, this is slightly different with um, high rates of antibiotic use and high rates of reported bacterial infection. And moving forwards, we've now seen the development of new therapies which have a significant impact on outcomes um, in the treatment of COVID-19. And with these, the majority of which are immunomodulatory in some way, there's a potential for enhancing the risk of bacterial infection in the context of COVID. I think one of the other challenges we've seen has been that in terms of the pressure that coronavirus places on healthcare, it's not a linear, fa it's not a linear fashion and it varies over time by, and by geography. And actually being able to put this into the context of looking at bacterial infections and COVID is incredibly challenging. And in terms of all of this and bringing it together, it's, it's often quite difficult to compare data between different studies and different reports. And that's because we don't really have any clear frameworks for how we should be reporting this data and analysing it. And so what, what I wanted to do today was actually to spend a little bit of time looking at most of these aspects, um, presenting some of the data which we do have, and then thinking a little bit about what we need to do moving forwards. So starting with the community, um, there have now been several reports looking at prescribing of antimicrobials during the coronavirus pandemic, and I've, I've listed four of them here, three of them looking at community prescribing in primary care, and one of them actually reporting on prescribing in dental practice. Um, overall, what we've seen is reports of reductions in the rates of antibiotic prescribing overall in primary care, with actual dental practice prescribing interestingly increasing um, quite significantly in certain regions of the United Kingdom between the first lockdown period within the UK between April and July 2020. If we look at antibiotic prescribing in England for all age groups in, in um, the community in terms of antibiotic items in the figure here, we're looking back from sort of March 2018 all the way through to the end of 2020. You can see that um, following the first wave of COVID-19 cases in the UK, overall the, the number of antibiotic items being prescribed in the community fell. And this tracked a reduction in the notifiable bacterial infections compared to the five-year average within the community for both respiratory and non-respiratory infections. Uh, one of my colleagues at Imperial, Dr. Nina Zhu, has done quite a bit of work looking within our local area, within Northwest London, at uh, the rates of antimicrobial prescribing within the community and uh, infection, particularly with SARS-CoV. And if we look at the figure on the left, we can see the number of individual cases of coronavirus or, or positive uh, swabs, at least, uh, in the orange bars across um, from February 2020 through to the end of November. And over, mapped over this is the number of antibiotic uh, prescribing items weekly in the dark blue line, followed by the predicted um, number based on previous year's data in dashed. And in terms of looking at community prescribing, what we observed was that during the initial peak in coronavirus cases in March and April time, there was a slight increase in antibiotic prescribing within the community, but then rates of antibiotic prescribing significantly fell within the community. And this reduced rate was actually maintained even following a fall in coronavirus cases and a fall in, uh, sorry, a cessation of the national lockdown period. 
there were some reports of increasing use of agents such as carbamoxiclav, particularly in March um, through to June of 2020 in older age groups within the community. But if we looked at the proportion of antimicrobials meeting the uh, World Health Organization AWARE classification, this has remained stable throughout the, the period of uh, 2020 through to 2021. And one of the, the things that I take out of this is if we look at individual patients who were tested positive or had a positive test for SARS-CoV-2 in the community, um, there were about 6,000 of those over the period of time looked in the in study. Uh, about 32% of those received an antibiotic prescription in the community within 14 days of this positive result still. If we move on to acute care, there have now been a number of studies from different sites internationally reporting on the experience of managing coronavirus cases in acute care, uh, ranging from hundreds through to thousands of patients. And there are some common themes which are coming through in terms of the rates of detectable bacterial infection. Patients presenting with evidence of community bacterial infection in the context of COVID-19 is very low. And even through um, hospital stay, the rates of hospital infection uh, by bacteria being reported, at least overall, go up to about 15%. Where antibiotic prescribing has been reported in these studies, it's significantly higher than the reports of um, bacterial infection, ranging from anywhere between 60 up to 95%. And overall, if we look at bacterial infection in acute care, the current evidence suggests that overall about 8% of patients with coronavirus in acute care will have a bacterial infection. About 3% will present with a respiratory bacterial infection and up to 15% will develop and hospital acquired. In terms of antimicrobial prescribing, around 72% of patients will receive antibiotics during admission for coronavirus. And uh, Brad Lankford and colleagues have recently published a nice paper looking at this in more detail, showing a little bit of variation actually between regions of the world in terms of the data that's out there at the moment in terms of prescribing, but overall very high, often quite broad spectrum in nature. And the duration of these treatments is often not clearly defined, which makes further analysis quite difficult to understand in terms of what points in the journey through someone's admission with coronavirus, these antibiotics are being delivered. Overall, there's quite wide heterogeneity in the way these studies are conducted and reported. And we don't, still don't have a true global picture due to few data from low resource settings. Moving on and focusing on critical care specifically, this is where we've seen quite a high rates of bacterial infection being reported in patients um, admitted to intensive care with coronavirus, ranging from somewhere between 20% to over 50% and associated once again with high rates of antimicrobial use. And really, critical care seems to be one of the pinch points where we are seeing significant amounts of bacterial infection associated with COVID-19. These appear to be healthcare associated, predominantly being reported as ventilator or hospital acquired pneumonias and central line associated bloodstream infections. We're seeing reports of fungal infection, which I know we're going to come on to and discuss in a lot more detail in later talks. And we're also seeing outbreaks of multidrug resistant organisms. Moving into the next phase of the pandemic as well, or, or this phase, I suppose we should say, we're now beginning to use a much wider amount of immunosuppressive treatment in patients with COVID. And the risk of potential bacterial infection within this cohort is still to be clearly defined. And finally, looking at current data, particularly around critical care, it's sometimes difficult to draw a comparison with baseline rates within units and centres, either pre-COVID or in non-COVID individuals. One study that has tried to look at the difference between COVID and non-COVID patients on ventilators was a study reported from the United Kingdom um, in Addenbrooke's hospital, where they compared 81 COVID to 144 non-COVID patients who were ventilated. And I think the, the striking thing that I take out of this, and which I think was suggested actually in a lot of the other studies, but there wasn't comparison there to draw from it, was that in terms of patients with COVID-19, they often, often have a lot of what we would consider as possible traditional risk factors for the development of ventilator-associated pneumonia. They tend to have uh, more of them presenting with uh, an acute respiratory distress syndrome type picture. They require often longer periods of paralysis and, for example, when they're being managed prone, they often have longer intensive care stays and longer periods of mechanical ventilation. And therefore, I'm not sure how surprising it is when you think about a cohort of very sick patients with a high number of risk factors for ventilator associated pneumonia presenting or having higher suspected VAPs and confirmed VAPs. <laughs> 
from this study, one thing that I did think was really interesting was looking at the causative organisms and on a subset, looking at the actual lung microbiome of patients between COVID and non-COVID presentations. The, the authors were able to demonstrate that in terms of causative organisms, actually the organisms and resistance profiles were very similar between COVID and non-COVID patients, as were the microbiomes of the lungs in small subsets of both of these individual cohorts. It would also uh, be amiss not to mention multidrug resistant organism outbreaks. And even from actually quite early on in the pandemic, there have been a number of publications which have looked at the potential factors which may drive antimicrobial resistance and outbreaks of resistant organisms um, during the coronavirus pandemic. And I've listed a few of the, the common recurring themes in the table here on the left. And actually now we're beginning to see uh, reports which are confirming some of these uh, factors as actually being associated with observations of increasing outbreaks. For example, there was a report from the United States recently which described the outbreak of three um, multidrug resistant gram-negative organisms associated with three coronavirus wards in a large hospital in the United States. Associating factors from this study were the presence of critical illness, high antimicrobial use, the evidence of pressure on their actual healthcare system, so requiring double occupancy of rooms that were designed for single patients, the changes required in team infrastructure to be able to support this influx of very sick patients, and also changes, and I think actually that probably should say um, non-adherence to infection prevention control practices, particularly when individuals are having to use enhanced personal protective equipment to try and protect themselves during these very challenging times managing very sick patients. So after looking at the, the data around bacterial infections in patients with COVID-19, I guess the, the real question is, what's the actual consequence of these? And actually quite early on, there were several studies which have associated bacterial infection in COVID-19 with worse patient outcomes. As a, as a caveat, I should say that these studies are often quite retrospective. And actually due to the, the nature and the number presenting, there are often only a small number of patients with bacterial infection reported in these individual studies. And as we've begun to understand more, it seems clear that when factoring in the association, many of the risk factors such as admission to critical care or mechanical ventilation are often not factored into the, the discussion around whether or not this is, is cause or association. And I think a study which begins to at least help shed more light on this was one by Neil Clancy and colleagues, which was published in Open Forum Infectious Disease, I think this month actually. Um, and it described the analysis of 621 patients from 75 international post-mortem studies. And the authors explored bacterial lung infection in patients with COVID-19. And sort of the headline messages from this study was that in terms of histopathologically, there was a demonstration of potential superinfection with bacteria of the lungs in about 32% of these cases that underwent post-mortem. In terms of actual proven infection, so that was the visualization of a bacterium, the uh, culture of a bacteria or molecular studies demonstrating a causative pathogen, this was only demonstrated in 8% of cases, with the remaining 24% only being possible infections. And I think really the take home message from this is though, when they looked at the actual cause of death in these patients, only 3% of cases was bacterial superinfection assigned as the cause of death for patients with COVID-19. The caveats obviously being that within this cohort, as with many hospitalized cohorts, there were high rates of antimicrobial prescribing reported at nearly 80% of patients receiving an antimicrobial. And looking at post-mortem studies obviously looks at a very selected population to begin with. But this data is actually correlating with other observations which we can make from studies looking, for example, at early antibiotics in patients with COVID-19. And there are, there are three randomized control trials, which I've just flagged here to, to discuss in a little bit more detail. First of all, the, the recovery trial, which looked at the role of azithromycin in moderate to severe coronavirus in hospitalized patients, um, has demonstrated no clinical benefit, whether anti-inflammatory or anti bacterial material from its addition compared to a standard of care. Now, I guess one of the big criticisms of trying to draw any conclusions from this is that we already know that most patients in hospital appear to be given an antibacterial anyway. So you could argue that actually azithromycin may be redundant in terms of antibacterial properties within this cohort. But I think what's been really interesting and I'm looking forward to seeing the full peer reviewed reports on are some of the results from the principal trial. Now, the principal trial has released statements on uh, outcomes from 
looking at both azithromycin and doxycycline in community cases of COVID-19 in patients over the age of 50 years of old age. So these are community managed patients where we know that actually there's probably less rate of antimicrobial prescribing um, compared to hospitals. And here they've demonstrated no meaningful benefit from the addition of antibiotics early in the management of community cases of COVID-19. That includes preventing hospitalization, present, preventing death, and speeding up recovery from COVID. Another question which in the clinical setting we're being asked a lot by our colleagues at the moment is what's the role and what is the role of immunosuppression going to be in terms of putting patients at increased risk of bacterial infections in coronavirus? And I know particularly there was some early observational data which suggested that for agents such as tocilizumab, there were observations of higher rates of secondary infection in patients who'd received tocilizumab versus controls. And I think that while probably more data is needed to be able to, until we can draw firm conclusions, at least looking at the randomized controlled trial data for both different doses of steroids and anti-interleukin-6 agents in terms of secondary outcomes and adverse drug events, there are no clear signals yet that actually patients receiving the intervention are at higher risk of developing a bacterial infection following it compared to those within the standard of care arm. So finally, if we want to try and understand some of these unknowns more, what do we need to do and what data do we need to collect? Well, really, I think we need to go back to what I've hopefully demonstrated today from some of the data which we presented. And that's that currently it's, it's quite heterogeneous. We see variable reporting of microbiology, antimicrobial prescribing and specific clinical data. There's a lack of standardized formats to collection and reporting. And often the data fails to actually contextualize the pressure being placed on healthcare systems by COVID-19 at the time it was actually being collected and, and reported. And therefore, it's important for us to think about how we can agree on developing certain frameworks to further explore bacterial infection associated with COVID-19. How can we take all these data that we are able to collect for individuals and operationalize them into a framework which is flexible based on clinical setting and resources available, that's able to not just report data for our overall sort of perspective, but also link with on the ground stewardship and IPC programs to actually help support decision making for people at, at the front end having to try and make changes and influence outcomes for our patients. And these frameworks really need to have some quite standardized approaches, essentially agreeing upon mechanisms of surveillance and reporting, not just infections, but prescribing an AMR in the context of coronavirus. There needs to be an agreement on what appropriate comparators are to support understanding of changes attributable to COVID-19, particularly between individual studies. Uh, ideally, we would be able to support comparison between different centers and regions and have prospective data which allows us to look at temporal trends um, and also consider both institutional and individual patient level factors. So hopefully in conclusion, um, after that very brief overview of things, I hope that I've demonstrated that at the moment, current evidence suggests that overall, there are low rates of bacterial infection in patients with COVID-19, that bacterial infection is predominantly healthcare associated and critical care being sort of the red flag there from the data that we currently have. We have little evidence that bacterial infection is a significant driver of mortality in patients with COVID and early antimicrobial therapy in COVID-19 at present does not appear to be significantly influencing outcomes. The impact of immunosuppression needs to be considered and better characterized. And moving forwards, what can we actually do? Well, the simple things, we can focus on the core principles of antimicrobial stewardship and infection prevention control. We can try and agree on some standardized frameworks to be able to collect data and actually report this, which will allow greater comparison between centers, sites and regions over time. And I guess most importantly, we need to consider and try and identify what the positive impacts are that COVID-19 is having on antimicrobial stewardship and antimicrobial resistance and maintain these through and post the COVID era, whilst mitigating some of the negative impacts which we're also seeing. So uh, thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Timothy, for this, uh, this nice overview. And uh, always uh, surprised to see that indeed in community, we use less antibiotics. Well, maybe in, in ICU is a very small spectrum of, uh, of, of obviously the whole array of, uh, of antibiotic use that we, we use more. Now, um, um, uh, I just want to remind our viewers uh, on the fact that there is a Q&A um, 
uh, possibility. And I can see that there's one here. Jose, can you see what is? Yes, in? it's a question from Peter Conlon and asks or would like to know from Tim if uh, he can say they can say anything, something else about which diagnostic criteria are uh, being used uh, to diagnose bacterial co or super infection in those COVID cohorts. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the, the current limitations of a lot of the data that we have. And it's, it's understandable. A lot of this data is, is retrospective in nature. And essentially, people have used very variable definitions depending on what they would within their institutions. Often, it's looking at a mix of potential uh, clinical parameters and either positive microbiology or high clinical suspicion. But it's been variable between different um, different centers. And as an example, I think when we look at some of the data in acute care, actually in trying to define bacterial sort of co-infection of respiratory co-infection on presentation, you see highly variable rates of microbiological sampling between individual studies. So some studies, for example, respiratory samples would only have been collected or attempted in 15% of cases, whereas in other studies, it's being collected in 80%. And so there are a huge number of potential variables which, which could influence those outcomes. And I think that's one of the reasons that having a more standardized approach that we try and take to this will help us draw better conclusions across, across different cohorts rather than relying on individual centers and diagnostic criteria. Thank you. Yes. There is an, there's another question and they say if for those nosocomial COVID-19 people, people who acquired COVID-19 in hospital, if their risk of uh, super infection is higher than those who are admitted from the community. So is there a higher risk? So um, it's an interesting question and it's something that I know is being looked at. Um, they haven't seen much data around it yet, but without trying to give too much of a, an opinion that's not evidence-based, my feeling would be that if you're classifying in terms of um, risk, I would imagine so based on the fact that patients have already had a lot more healthcare exposure, but I think it's still something that requires characterization. I haven't seen much data on that yet. There's some work ongoing at Imperial at the moment, trying to look at that and looking at sort of uh, hospital onset COVID infections in more general, but um, I haven't seen any of the preliminary data. Okay, we question, do you agree that people with severe inf or critical infections should be routinely prescribed in antimicrobial empirically or given the data that you are presenting on the frequency of co-infection, this antibiotic should not be routinely started? I mean, I think it's really difficult and uh, having uh, spent the first part of the pandemic on intensive care and the second part working with stewardship teams trying to uh, trying to limit the amount of antibiotics we use. I think in terms of starting antibiotics in critically ill patients, it's, it's very difficult. And it, my gut feeling is that part of the, the stewardship agenda there and what we can actually achieve is how we rapidly try and uh, de-escalate or stop antibiotics in patients when it becomes clear that there isn't a bacterial infection. I think if someone is incredibly unwell uh, presenting to hospital, um, it's very difficult there to be, to be judicious in your approach. And actually it's, it's picking those right time points where we can intervene and stop antibiotics early in critically ill patients. And I, I won't go into any more of that just now because I wonder whether one of our next talks will be a bit more focused on that in terms of biomarkers, perhaps. Okay, yes, uh, yes, indeed. And there was a question already on PCT, and I'm sure that Larissa will uh, will get back to that on the third uh, in the third talk. I, 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 I think there's one interesting one that I, I already had in mind uh, myself. So uh, Kurt Azapuzlam asks, why do you think standard and contact precautions did not lower nosocomial infection rates even in the first wave? Um, again, I think it's probably a mix of things. And so, I know that uh, there are reports, for example, from some of the um, outbreaks that actually, in terms of using PPE, it's, it's, I think it's probably a bigger thing around infection prevention control. And it's all very well having these contact precautions, but if we're failing to do things like simple hand hygiene, when you're wearing double gloves and the challenges around how you wash hands and clean between those patients, actually, it's, I think it's a much bigger picture there in terms of the transmission. And I guess in a way, it's probably not a very good analogy, but in terms of 
lighting the flames, you can prescribe lots of antibiotics, but actually if you, if you don't control the spread of that through things like infection prevention control, then um, actually it's, it's still going to run away. So I think it's probably a more complex issue, which involves a lot of IPC issues and hand hygiene, a lot of basics that we, we need to, to go back to. And understandably when healthcare is under pressure and limited staffing and redeployment, it's, it's, it's very easy to sit back and say that it's a problem, but the solutions sometimes take time to, to, to actually implement. Thank you very much, and I agree. Uh, we've seen a, a huge increase in CLAPSI cases in uh, bacterial infections uh, due to the um, uh, to Lyme's. And, uh, uh, but we also put our patients uh, in prone positioning all the time and uh, yeah. <laughs> very difficult to, to, to maintain that uh, standard of hygiene. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll stop it here at the moment. There's been a lot of uh, questions still asked and these can be answered uh, by you, Timothy, uh, during the, the rest of the presentation. So everybody who's asked this question, will try to answer them, uh, but it won't be in, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the setting for all of us. So we, we need to move on to the next speaker and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to, um, to introduce Introduce uh, Paul Verwey. Professor Paul Verwey is a professor of mycology uh, at uh, Radboud University Medical Hospital in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. He's an expert truly uh, on the subject of aspergillosis, invasive aspergillosis, has done a lot of studies before um, on this topic in influenza and now also in, in COVID. So the main reason why we asked Paul is because we felt insecure about what it actually is, COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis. How should we, how should we diagnose it and, 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 and how often does it actually occur and, and what should we be treating it with or how should we approach um, uh, treatment issues? So Paul, thank you very much for being here and uh, the floor is yours again. Thank you. I will uh, start my presentation. So hello everybody. I would like to um, talk about invasive aspergillosis uh, in patients with, uh, with COVID. So these are my disclosures. So this might be a lab result you re receive uh, in your hospital, um, a patient on the ICU where bronchial aspirate is collected and uh, you get the culture result back aspergillus fumigatus. And the patient uh, X, that is a patient uh, who is COVID-19 uh, positive. Um, and I think um, that my first question uh, would be, if this is a critically ill patient who is uh, ventilated and has a positive bronchial aspirate with aspergillus, what would you do? Would you start antifungal therapy? Uh, would you stop um, dexamethasone or other immune suppressive treatment? Uh, would you do both? Um, would you do additional diagnostics uh, with a bronchoscopy and a BEL? Or if the patient is uh, stable, would you ignore this result? So please vote on this question. Okay, so if we look at the results, the majority um, would do a bronchoscopy and a BEL. Um, and I will um, discuss that further um, because I think that is indeed a, a good approach. So um, as Jeroen already indicated, um, a very important question is if you find aspergillus in COVID-19 patients in the intensive care unit, um, do you need to treat or do you not need to treat? And actually, this is quite a difficult question to answer. And I think um, to be able to answer that, we have to uh, try to understand um, what, what, what it means if you find aspergillus uh, in these patients. So um, if you look at invasive aspergillosis, um, we, we, we know it very well um, in patients who are neutropenic, who have leukemia, um, but over time, uh, new risk groups have emerged uh, in intensive care units uh, and since 2009 uh, also in associated with influenza. And of course, the question is if COVID-19 is now also a risk group. 
So if we think about uh, invasive aspergillosis, we know, of course, the patients who have these CT lesions with, uh, with an halo sign. And if you would look at this lesion, you can see a, a nodule infiltrate with bleeding around that. And if you would look in microscopy, you would see the hyphae growing. So there are a number of cr critical uh, issues uh, in the in invasive aspergillosis. And the first is that the fungus needs to have an opportunity to cause invasive disease. Uh, and often um, these are risk factors which have been well described, at least in, in, in neutropenic patients. The second is that the hallmark of invasive aspergillosis is the ability to cause angioinvasion. And the marker for that is uh, serum biomarkers, especially serum galactomannan. And when that becomes positive, it's an indication that you have uh, invasive growth into the blood vessels. And I think another question is, is what is the natural cause of infection of invasive aspergillosis? So what is the baseline uh, mortality? And the best way to, to get an idea of that is to look at patients who have not been treated. So I wanted to look at these three aspects uh, and start with those patients uh, who we know well, who are neutropenic and develop invasive aspergillosis, and then look at the patients who develop invasive aspergillosis in associated with influenza, and then move on to those who uh, develop it in, uh, in COVID-19. So if you look at the opportunity, we, uh, we have these URTC MSG criteria, uh, which are well uh, studied and well described. Um, and they are um, factors like hematological malignancies, a solid organ transplant, corticosteroids, and a number of other risk factors. So uh, neutropenic patients, this will be really the dominant um, opportunity uh, and the host factors to cause invasive aspergillosis. So if we then look at the, uh, the marker for angio invasion in these patients, this is a study in, uh, in ICU patients where the patients had proven invasive aspergillosis. And if you look at the galactomannan serum, in neutropenic patients, about 70% uh, have a positive serum galactomannan. And also, if you look at the histology in these patients, you see that there's a lot of fungus uh, and, and not much inflammation. So about 70% uh, of patients uh, have a positive serum galactomannan, and we use that as a marker for angioinvasion. And then the question is, is what is the baseline mortality in these patients? And that's of course very difficult because these patients are treated. Um, but like a surrogate for this, we could look at patients with voriconazole resistance invasive aspergillosis and look at the mortality in patients who get voriconazole therapy. And this was a, a, a cohort study um, where patients received voriconazole and were not switched. Uh, and the mortality in this group was 67%. So this gives you an idea about the, uh, the natural cause of the infection in, uh, in this host group. So if we then move to influenza and aspergillosis, you can see that the number of patients um, that have this URTC host factor is actually much lower. So there must be another uh, factor which actually provides aspergillus uh, the opportunity to cause invasive infection. And of course, uh, the first fact is the influenza infection itself. It will have lytic effects on the epithelium, uh, but also influenza affects macrophages and uh, monocytes. And it causes uh, impairment of the NADPH oxidase, which is an important um, uh, defense against invasive fungal infections. And in addition to that, um, you have immune dysregulation. So you have cytokine storm syndromes and uh, macrophage activation syndromes which also might uh, contribute to the susceptibility of the host. Also, the use of oseltamivir um, has been associated with increased risk for invasive aspergillosis and also the use of corticosteroids. So if we look in cohorts with influenza-associated asp aspergillosis, a lot of patients are serum galactomannan positive, um, and that's actually quite similar to the neutropenic patients. Um, and we know that the mortality is also high in treated patients, it's about 51%. So thinking about a surrogate for untreated patients, um, I think we could look at the patients with invasive trachyobronchitis because in those patients, um, an important part of the infection is, is, is located inside the, the trachea and the bronchi, which is very difficult, accessible for systemic antifungal therapy.
And a recent study showed that the uh, survival in the patients with um, influenza and invasive tracheal bronchitis is very low, it's only 10%. So it has a very high mortality. And also these patients, they uh, are nearly all uh, serum galactomanon positive, indicating that there's a very early on uh, angio invasion. And if you look in the histology in the patients, you indeed see that there's a lot of fungus, there's a high burden. Uh, there's also evidence for tissue invasion and no clearly evidence for angio invasion. So if we then move to, uh, to Kappa, um, we can see that actually um, the proportion of patients who have ERTC uh, host factors is very low, it's only 10%. So here also there are other factors which make uh, these patients susceptible to have uh, invasive aspergillosis. So the SARS of uh, two inf uh, virus gives lytic effects in, 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 the, in the airways and in the lungs, but there's no clear effect known uh, on uh, macrophages or monocytes. Of course, in these patients, we also see this immune dysregulation uh, and um, that could also increase the susceptibility to invasive aspergillosis. So what do we know about um, uh, Kappa? So this was a study by Bartoletti and colleagues who looked at 108 patients uh, in the intensive care unit. And the, the interesting is that they did systematic BEL in these patients. And um, they found that uh, 30 patients, so that is 27.7% um, had evidence for an invasive aspergillosis based on the positive uh, bowel galactomanon. Interestingly, they found that only one out of 16 patients were positive in the serum. So that's actually a very low um, percentage of patients. What they did found, find is that patients who had evidence for invasive aspergillosis had a significantly higher mortality, uh, which was 44% compared to 90% in patients without uh, invasive aspergillosis. Also, they found that patients who were treated with antifungal therapy benefited from that uh, with a lower mor mortality. And that has been found in, in, in several studies. But you can also see that the mortality in patients who did not receive antifungal therapy was 59%. So that's uh, still quite substantial. So if you look then in, um, in the histology of a patient who, who had uh, a proven uh, Kappa, you can see that on the one side there are high fee, um, and they indeed they show tissue invasion. Uh, also, you can see that there uh, are cells infiltrating in that area. But if you look uh, um, carefully in the histology, there's actually no evidence for angio invasion, at least not in this patient. So um, in these patients. Um, it's very clear that the, that the serum galactomanon is not very helpful to diagnose it, and that might indicate that the angio invasion is not very common. So we recently um, did a study uh, in, in intensive care patients um, who had evidence for aspergillus, and this was a collaboration with uh, Pasteur Institute, with uh, Leuven, with a number of hospitals in the Netherlands and with Cardiff. So we had patients and controls and we classified them according to the new um, consensus definition. And we had one proven 36 probable cases and 19 possi uh, possible cases. There were 21 patients who were colonized uh, and there were 142 patients who had no evidence for, uh, for Kappa. So when we looked at the mortality, indeed we found a significant difference. So the mortality uh, in patients with Kappa was 51% compared to 26% in patients where we, there was no evidence for invasive aspergillosis. So also the number of patients with positive serum galactomanon was low, but it was higher than in the study of Bartoletti. It was about 15%. But what was interesting is that if you had a positive serum galactomanon, the mortality was much higher. It was 85% for galactomanon compared to 37% if you had Kappa, which was serum collectomal negative. And the same uh, was found for beta D-glucan. So when we look at these different patient groups, it seems that there's an incremental mortality. So patients without Kappa, they had a mortality of 
the mortality of patients who were colonized was also uh, low, was only 19%. Patients who had a possible kappa, the uh, mortality was 45%. And patients with proven a probable kappa, it was 51%. But this group is actually uh, a group which consists of patients who were serum galactaminone positive, where the mortality was really high, and the patient group who were uh, biomarker negative. You can see that the mortality in that group is much lower and uh, is some like 10, between 10 and 15% lower, higher than patients who do not have invasive aspergillosis. So what I think um, that this reflects is the stage of infection uh, of aspergillosis. So patients with a positive serum galactomonon, they will have advanced disease with angioinvasion. But if it's negative, then um, you might have tissue invasion, but it could also be the case that these patients are colonized, especially in the upper respiratory tract. So then the question is, how do we diagnose this um, knowing um, this incremental um, infection in these patients? So if you look at sputum, it will be positive in colonized patients and it might be positive in patients who have angio invasion. But the positive predictive value for kappa is actually very low, indicating that many uh, patients who have upper respiratory tract colonization uh, will be positive. But if you then do a BEL, that will then be negative. The bronchial aspirate um, is of course a little bit uh, deeper material, but also the positive predicted value was only 20%. So uh, not a very good uh, way to diagnose the infection. So um, several study centers use non-bronchial lavage where, where you uh, limit the aerialization risk of your procedure and the positive predicted value uh, was 52%. Um, and um, bronchoscopy and BEL, we don't have the pro positive predictive value because it's used to classify the patients, uh, I think remains uh, the best way to, to sample the lower airways. So sputum and bronchial aspirate um, are not very useful tools to diagnose uh, kappa. The um, uh, bronchial, uh, the NBL uh, might be, but I think we need more data. Um, and the bronchoscopy um, is, I think, the way to diagnose this. So serum galactomnon is actually useful uh, because it kind of helps you to stage the severity of the infection. So although it's negative in 85% of patients, if it's positive, it indicates um, that this patient really needs antifungal therapy. So the, the problem is that um, we don't have a clear the uh, diagnostic test to make this distinction between colonization and tissue invasion. So you could do a biopsy, but of course, in many patients um, that will be precluded. And we actually really lack a biomarker which could help us differentiate between those two entities. So if we then look at the treatment interventions, of course, antifungal therapy is something which we uh, give to patients, uh, especially, of course, if they have advanced disease. Um, in patients with um, only a positive galactomonon in the BEL, we can't be sure that they have an invasive infection, um, and we might overtreat patients who are actually colonized. Also, I think it's important that um, the, um, the response of, uh, of patients might not uh, solely be due to the uh, administration of antifungal therapy, but also the rebalancing of the immune uh, dysregulation, for instance, through the administration of uh, dexamethasone, might also uh, help to, to limit um, the, uh, the invasive infection um, of aspergillus. And that's, of course, uh, difficult because also we know that corticosteroids are also risk factor to, to, to develop uh, invasive aspergillosis. And also, if we could limit the lytic effects of, uh, of the uh, viral infection, that also might uh, contribute to the response of patients. So what does this mean for the management of patients? Well, if a patient is admitted to the ICU and has a positive uh, COVID-19 test, I think um, you could use triggers to uh, do a diagnostic workup um, in patients. Um, for instance, if the BEL culture becomes positive or sputum, this might be an indication that this patient has an invasive aspergillosis. Uh, 
Also, if there's a pulmonary or clinical deterioration, which we don't understand, um, that also might be a reason to do a diagnostic workup. Maybe the CT is also useful, but um, it's clear that, that there are a lot of um, aspecific changes in CT scans. Maybe cavities might uh, be indicative of an invasive aspergillosis. And I think the best uh, approach then is to do a bronchoscopy uh, because um, you could look at the airways. So you could see if there's a tracheobronchitis in these patients um, and you could do a, a, a BAL and look for the biomarkers, uh, the galactomonon or the PCR and also culture. And I think even though it's uh, often uh, negative and serum galactomonon is informative uh, in the sense that it will help you stage uh, the infection. So if it's positive, um, you can start antifungal therapy. Um, the question is, of course, what do you do with your uh, immune suppression? And um, I think um, automatically stopping that is not something we do. Um, I think um, it's important to look, uh, to consider in each patient individually um, if that is sensible or, or not, because it also might have a beneficial effect in, in combating this infection. And if uh, the diagnostic workup is negative, then uh, you could stop antifungal therapy if you have started that in, in the patient. So in conclusion, um, I think that um, Kappa is a complex disease and it actually changes uh, our thinking. It's, we're used to this neutropenic hematology setting where aspergillus is usually lethal. Uh, but in Kappa, actually, um, you have this continuum of colonization uh, the stage of tissue invasion and, and uh, eventually angio invasion. So I think that bronchoscopy in, in BL remains the cornerstone of, uh, of diagnostics, but we have to improve our strategies uh, in these patients. And, and it would be very useful if we could uh, develop biomarkers, which actually tell us there is tissue invasion by aspergillus. And the treatment, uh, as I indicated, relies on a personalized approach uh, involving antifungal therapy, but also taking into account the other measures you could take um, to uh, regulate the immune dysregulation. So this was my last slide. I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much, Paul. A very intriguing and interesting subject. Uh still uh, very much in development at the moment. So I'm glad we could uh, um, pick your brain on this. Um, so again, uh, there, there have been some questions in the Q&A list. Um, um, Jose, do you want to, to present these? Yes, there are a couple questions. First question is, what, do you have any opinion? What do you think of beta-glucan as a biomarker for Kappa? And the second question is, if do you think that environmental factors have been important in this, in the amount of uh, kappa that we are seeing or the differences that we are seeing among centers, even continents? Yeah, so um, all very interesting questions. Um, I think there is a role for beta deglucan um, in these uh, patients. Um, as I showed you that if they are positive, um, the serum beta glucan is positive, then the mortality is uh, significantly uh, higher than in patients who are negative. Um, so the problem is, is that beta glucan is not specific for aspergillus and it might be positive due to other reasons. Uh, so that's something you have to um, be aware of. And I think um, it should always be used in combination with um, with a bronchoscopy and BEL to, to see what, what is happening in the lungs. Uh, and on the other hand, I don't think you can use uh, a negative beta glucan to rule out the disease uh, because um, we think that this is this phase of tissue invasion where, where uh, antifungal therapy um, may be indicated um, and uh, the biomarkers will be negative in those patients. Um, so the other question uh, relates to the frequency of kappa, and if you look in the literature, the, um, there's been a, a significant variation in, in the frequency. So there are some centers which find 3% of kappa, and there are centers which find more than 30%. Um, and um, it's not 
clear. I think there might be some true variation in that. One, one problem is that um, only in December um, of last year, the consensus definition was published for, for Kappa. And there's, there has been quite a lot of variation in definitions used to, to classify uh, patients. Um, and I think another issue is that uh, during the first wave, um, and we were very restrictive in doing bronchoscopies because of the aerialization risk. Um, and there was a lot of variation uh, also in what kind of materials were used to, to indicate if a patient had kappa or not. So I think um, there are some factors which uh, actually influence uh, the frequencies which have been reported. And, and now in the second and third wave, I think um, we are more willing to do bronchoscopies in these patients and we have these case uh, definitions. So I, I hope that we will get a better picture of the true uh, epidemiology uh, of this infection. Thank you. Thank you. Jose, um, um, another question there. I, I see one on, on, on a, I, I think it's an interesting question by Joveria Paruki. What do, we about, what do we do about patients who are too hypoxic to undergo bronchial lavage? Well, I recognize that I'm an ICU physician and it is sometimes challenging. Uh, but the question I think that has really come forward from this is uh, doing a BAL may be a bit too much, but uh, just looking into the trachea is often not that much of, a, um, of an invasive procedure. So, Paul, well, would you think that, um, you know, if you see plaques or you see um, uh, signs of an acute uh, tracheal bronchitis, would that be enough to diagnose? Uh, would you really need to do a BAL if you see those uh, mold, uh, the mold growing in, in, in your, in your trachea? Well, I think um, it will be important actually to confirm that, that it's aspergillus because of course the virus itself also causes uh, damage to the trachea, which um, so I think you would have to do a, a, a biopsy or a mucosal biopsy of those patients to actually demonstrate that aspergillus is there. But um, if you find that, um, I, I would um, certainly classify that as a kappa. Um, and um, if you can't do the lavage in those patients, um, probably this would be sufficient. Um, we actually, what, what we see is that this um, tronchitis it was actually, it's very frequent in associating with, with influenza. And we think that uh, between 30 and 50% of patients uh, may have um, tracheal bronchitis in, in influenza. Um, but in coronavirus infection, we, we are not sure about that. It looks like it's a bit lower uh, the frequency, but so might be uh, underreported due to the fact that we, uh, didn't do the, the, the bronchoscopies that often during the first wave. Thank you. I, I think we have time for one last question, Jose. Um, yes, yeah. I think there's one interesting question. If uh, Is there any role to prophylax patients who are colonized with aspergillus? COVID-19 critically ill patients who are colonized, you think they have no disease yet. And would you go for prophylaxis and how? Yes, yeah, so that's also, I think, a very interesting question because um, um, we've also been thinking of, and there's a pilot study with influenza to, to see if prophylaxis uh, would be an effective way to, uh, to approach that. Uh, the, the problem is that, that the antifungal agents at this moment are not licensed for prophylaxis in the intensive care unit setting. Um, and it could be. Um, Giving prophylaxis uh, will be helpful because you might prevent this progression uh, of the infection. Um, I think that at the current state, there is enough evidence actually to, to um, advocate that. Um, that is what we think about. Uh, also, um, there's some discussion about using nebulized antifungals in these patients. Um, also, that is something where is there are no clinical studies actually to support that. Thank you very much, Paul. I think that that was a, that was a lot of uh, 
interesting questions and um, uh, uh, there's, a, there, there's, there's other questions coming in. So if you have some time later on in the, in the, the show here, you can actually answer them. Thank you very Thank you. much. And uh, Jose, do you want to introduce our next speaker? Yes, uh, our next speaker is Larissa May, uh, Dr. Larissa May. She's professor of emergency medicine from University of California, Davis and her professional and her research focus is mainly on outpatient antimicrobial stewardship. And uh, her talk is going to bring up the topic of biomarkers. We've been, we've been taught uh, in a previous presentation that the rate of bacterial infections, co-infections or superinfections is low, but despite that, the the prescribing rate in COVID-19 patients who need to be hospitalized is very high. So could biomarkers help us to uh, reduce unnecessary antimicrobial prescription? And if so, how should we use them? And uh, Larissa May is our woman today for this uh, very, very important topic. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you for the kind introduction. So the objectives for today are going to be to talk about antimicrobial stewardship strategies during this COVID pandemic, but really with a focus on diagnostic testing. And I'm going to try to cover a broad swath of uh, diagnostics, including rapid molecular and other pathogen diagnostics, as well as host response in promoting antimicrobial stewardship and patient outcomes. Um, very interesting preparing this talk because honestly, there's not yet that much data, um, but I think there is some promise for some of these tools. Just my disclosures. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, COVID-19. Um, most of you don't really need this, but um, we do know that the clinical presentation causes a lot of challenges for us in terms of diagnosis because it's variable. Um, and that currently used prognostic data is a really kind of limited value. Um, that includes some clinical scores, uh, laboratory uh, markers, imaging, um, and biomarkers uh, used alone um, without uh, other tools. And then we also know that the high volumes uh, of COVID-19 right now and escalating supportive care tax our limited resources and that many patients that are admitted to the ward are ultimately end up in the ICU requiring oxygen and mechanical ventilation. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the diagnostic strategies we have and why some of this might be insufficient and some directions for the future. Just to frame this um, in terms of what we all do in clinical care. I just want to have a case vignette. This is a real patient that I had um, presenting to our emergency department uh, in uh, early December. It's a 52-year-old African-American male with diabetes and hypertension. He came in complaining of a couple of days of pleuritic chest pain, cough, chills, and myalgias. This presentation sounding familiar, right? Um, his only risk factor was that he'd recently traveled to visit his daughter in Los Angeles, and she had lost her sense of taste and smell, but was otherwise asymptomatic. Um, as everyone knows, Los Angeles really is the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in the United States currently. Um, at, while he was at the post office the day before, he'd had a brief episode of syncope and really otherwise um, was feeling well other than some nausea. And then you look at the vitals, he's febrile, his heart rate's at the upper limit of normal. He seems to be oxygenating adequately, at least at rest. Um, however, he is an obese male. Even though he's well appearing, his lung exam reveals some scattered ronchi. Um, he is found to be hyperglycemic and hyponatremic. Um, and because you suspect the patient's gonna be admitted to the hospital, you um, start, uh, you order some uh, D-dimer studies as well as inflammatory markers that are elevated. And his chest X-ray is consistent with COVID-19 pneumonia. Of course, because of the elevated uh, fibrinogen degradation products, we order a CT, which is negative for PE, but does confirm uh, the diagnosis of COVID pneumonia. And you do have access in your emergency department to a SARS-CoV rapid PCR test, and that is positive. So how do we optimize antibiotic stewardship in the ED um, and other setting during COVID-19? You know, we have some traditional approaches to stewardship, such as academic detailing, education, care pathways, and guidelines, but here we're really in uncharted territory. Um, and so the focus of the rest of the talk is going to be on how can implementation of host biomarkers and rapid COVID-19 diagnostics help support antimicrobial stewardship in this era. I just wanna highlight that there really aren't many recommendations currently. Um, there are certainly none for us in the United States. The IDSA and Shea have been pretty quiet about antimicrobials, um, whereas they do give guidance for how to treat COVID-19 specifically. They don't really talk about antimicrobial stewardship. 
Um, the uh, NICE organization in the UK did come up with some um, strategies looking at empiric antibiotics um, and suggest they should be started for suspicion of bacterial infection. Again, we have the challenges. How do you know you have a bacterial infection? Um, and then recommend the use of community acquired pneumonia guidance unless the patient's been hospitalized for more than 48 hours and you suspect a healthcare associated infection. Um, central to this is really the microbiological evaluation. Um, and then you can see here the typical recommendations as well as using the like local antibiogram and limiting the duration of antimicrobials. And we also saw from a previous speaker that really there's been no evidence that starting these um, in COVID-19 without bacterial infection really makes a difference in clinical outcomes. Um, there was another group, the CMI Dutch working group, uh, that looked at limited evidence against supporting restrictive antibiotic use and admission, pretty similar recommendations to NICE. Um, again, here in the United States, we really don't have any guidance and um, the practice is generally to overtreat rather than undertreat, quote unquote, just in case, um, especially if the patient's critically ill. So I'm going to focus on the rapid diagnostics and biomarkers, but I just want to highlight that diagnostics by themselves cannot really support stewardship alone, so that we really need to think about all the other approaches to antimicrobial stewardship, such as multidisciplinary collaboration, our antimicrobial stewardship program teams, implementation of local guidelines and pathways, providing feedback to clinicians on their prescribing behaviors. And I think we do have a new opportunity to incorporate clinical decision support through our electronic health records. And perhaps we can think about diagnostic stewardship as well as antimicrobial stewardship. So what are the role of rapid diagnostics in acute infection? We know there are many opportunities, but also some challenges to our current use of biomarkers. Um, and at least in the United States, we haven't taken up many of these biomarkers as much perhaps as in Europe. Um, but we do have application of potential testing strategies that really need to be integrated into the environment appropriately so that we really need to consider our workflows depending what setting we're working in, whether the tests and implementation of stewardship align with our clinical operations and efficiency, and then really from a clinician standpoint to have a lens on the antimicrobial stewardship and patient safety components. So what we really typically think about when we're thinking about stewardship is rapid alignment. So we really want to consider the balance between the timing of antibiotics, empiric versus targeted antibiotic selection, as well as what diagnostic tools we have at our disposal. And also we need to rely on our local antibiograms and susceptibilities, and perhaps consideration of patient specific risk factors. So shifting forward, um, because I have such a broad area to cover, I'm gonna start first with the rapid testing for the SARS-CoV-2 pathogen. And so we all know that RTQPCR is currently the gold standard, although um, there are other test methodologies that are uh, coming to light, including antigen testing. Um, and these detect viral nucleic acids in patient specimens. And point of care tests, of which I believe there's only one or two available currently, can minimize the burden on lab personnel and reach remote and rural settings. But the validation as to the performance characteristics of these tests is really key to clinician trust and, of course, uh, use of those tests. As I mentioned, there's some other tests that are uh, either available now or coming at the point of care. Uh, most antigen detection tests rely on lateral flow immunoassays um, that sacrifice sensitivity um, in order to uh, obtain speed. Uh, and then, of course, there's rapid PCR for multiple specimen types. Um, and here are some of the ones that are uh, available currently. We also um, are looking at microfluidic based technologies, although I think the promise of microfluidics has not yet been realized, but I know that there are some companies that have submitted um, for, uh, exam for in the United States, for example, for uh, emergency use authorization from the FDA. And then we all know the um, limitations of isothermal amplification, which is fast, but may also uh, sacrifice sensitivity. And then I just want to throw up the slide. We were talking about BAL in a previous talk, but collection site really matters here. So you can see this is data from the beginning of the pandemic, but looking at nasal versus throat swabs um, and the different specimen types. And you can see um, that in general, the uh, nasopharyngeal swab remains the most sensitive, um, at least early in the course of the illness. We do know that for patients that are in the ICU that may be intubated or may no longer be shedding virus in their nasopharynx that bronchialveolar lavage can sometimes provide an advantage, um, but of course it's much more invasive. And then the viral kinetics matter. So we know that the SARS-CoV-2 viral load will vary. Uh, and we also uh, still don't understand completely the kinetics in asymptomatic patients. And those patients may have viremia below the detection limit. Um, that viremia can also occur before symptoms. 
uh, potentially peaking at symptom onset. So it's very critical as to when we initiate diagnostic testing in these patients. And, and you can get false negatives, obviously, um, because of this. I also want to highlight um, for us clinicians that you know, we typically like to focus on sensitivity and specificity as performance characteristics of diagnostic tests. But really here, what we need to think about um, is positive and negative predictive value. Um, and that's the concern over false negatives, for example, or false positives. And really that depends upon the prevalence of COVID-19 in the population. So as uh, you go into the pandemic state and you're having uh, active community transmission, um, then your diagnostic tests may have better performance in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, limiting false negatives. But then if you think about it um, during areas uh, where there's low transmission, then um, you know, it is a little bit harder to diagnose. So current limitations are for our diagnostic test is that clinical judgment for infectious diseases diagnosis remains insensitive. And I would uh, waver that diagnostic technology in its current state fails to provide quick and accurate data, which leads at least in the emergency department and I wager also in other settings like critical care, a conservative management approach with antibiotics. Of course, this benefit is offset by the cost and potential complications uh, from unnecessary treatment, such as adverse events like C. difficile, or sorry, Clostridioides difficile. So what we really need is a paradigm shift. So we need our novel diagnostics and algorithms to guide clinical decision-making. We really wanna shift from a strategy of empiric antibiotic use to early targeted treatment. This is expected to improve outcomes and decrease adverse events for patients. And there's also, of course, the downstream public health benefit of decreasing antimicrobial resistance. As we all know, in many of our clinical settings, we have a number of challenges to work from. Um, I'm not sure about Europe, but in the United States, our hospitals tend to be very crowded. Um, we have a lot of boarding, meaning patients are in hallways waiting to be admitted. This is obviously not a good situation for COVID-19. And we have to make very quick decisions with limited clinical and diagnostic information. Um, we also have some issues with follow-up. Um, and because emergency departments uh, in this country really do focus on uh, providing care for vulnerable populations as a safety net, we often have patients that are not able to follow up elsewhere. And so essentially, we're using antibiotics to make ourselves feel better. And of course, patient satisfaction may be still driving some of this use of antimicrobials for those patients that are being discharged um, that don't need to be admitted. So what about these diagnostic tests? So what do we want them to look like? Obviously, we want the ideal test. So high sensitivity and specificity is optimal, especially for high-risk conditions. Um, like COVID-19, we really want quick turnaround, especially if patients are not going to be admitted. Um, we want these tests to be simple to interpret and really need to convince clinicians, is there a benefit to using these rapid diagnostic tests versus simple empiric treatment? There are some major gaps that I'll touch on a little bit later in the talk, is that the molecular or rapid diagnostic approach typically doesn't take into account the host response. And so we do have these issues with colonization um, and determining invasive infection. Highlighting point of care, I really just wanna talk about some challenges to point of care specific to COVID-19. Um, especially for PCR, we continue to have supply chain issues. Um, this is not just for PCR reagents, but also for the materials that are used to support specimen collection and testing, such as nasal swabs and media. Um, we also still don't very well understand asymptomatic versus symptomatic screening. And uh, many of these tests are not approved for asymptomatic screening. We still have a poor understanding of which patients uh, develop severe illness. So we know certain risk factors, uh, namely age, um, as well as uh, other factors such as obesity and cardiovascular disease, but we still don't understand why young healthy people necessarily um, develop the inflammatory response they do. Um, and there is a great potential for rapid accurate testing to decrease antibiotic use, um, especially if they're incorporated with clinical decision support and other antimicrobial stewardship interventions. So I wanna shift a little bit from pathogen testing to talk a little bit about some biomarkers. And I really wanna focus uh, on procalcitonin. I know there was a question in the chat earlier. Um, so we know the data suggests that among patients with uh, varying types and severities of acute respiratory tract infection, we can use PCT to guide decisions um, about antibiotics. And that results in lower rates of exposure to antibiotics by patients, antibiotic related adverse effects and mortality. Um, and this is not specific to COVID-19, this is just for lower respiratory tract infection. Um, there's been a number of studies that have been published, including um, several meta-analyses. Um, and so I think this is pretty well accepted in the literature, although uh, implementation has been slower than expected. I think that with COVID-19, uh, more people are turning to PCT. 
So let's talk about PCT in COVID-19. So what we've seen typically is that levels tend to be very low when patients are first admitted to the hospital, 0.25 micrograms per liter, or even less at less than 0.1 micrograms per liter, which is consistent uh, with the fact that COVID-19 is a viral illness. Um, but then these levels can rise during the course of the illness. Um, and it's postulated this may be as some patients uh, may be developing bacterial co-infection or perhaps the COVID-19 pneumonitis that's occurring in the severe inflammatory process uh, may also be leading to rises in PCT. Uh, we do know that PCT tends to be very high, for example, in patients who have a lot of tissue damage, like burn patients. Um, PCT uh, reflects um, secretion from a variety of tissues. And so there are some major limitations to the use of PCT alone. Um, there was also a study recently that showed that PCT might be elevated in patients with severe versus moderate disease, so up to four times higher and up to eight times higher in critical illness. Again, COVID-19 patients that don't have a bacterial superinfection um, will still present with other um, inflammatory markers like high initial CRP levels, even though their PCT levels may be low to moderate. Um, but during ICU admission um, in general, there was a study that was conducted by Van Berkel et al that suggests that PCT levels greater than one um, may rule in a bacterial infection, whereas concentrations of less than 0.25, similar to other viral infections, may rule out secondary bacterial infection with good predictive values. And so this is just, um, hopefully you can see this, a, a graphical demonstration of this. Um, the top graph is really showing the days relative to the start of COVID-19 symptoms and PCT levels on the y-axis. And you can see uh, initially the PCT levels are low here, um, they may climb a little bit uh, upon the, the early course of the illness and then tend to, to decrease over time. Um, you can see in the, in the B section here, um, looking at patients uh, with both PCT and CRP who have uh, bacterial secondary infection versus no secondary infection, you do see that rise in PCT as the patient is developing a secondary infection. Um, and similarly for CRP, otherwise uh, levels tend to stay pretty low or decrease over time. Um, and then finally, you can see the area uh, under the ROC curve here so that, um, you know, depending upon the levels at which we're looking, the sensitivity of PCT can be pretty high at those lower levels for ruling out that bacterial um, secondary infection um, with CRP being a little bit less sensitive. Um, so using these in combination might provide some value in terms of ruling out secondary bacterial infection. But there are some major challenges to PCT. There's limited data as to the performance in COVID-19 as I've presented. There are also some challenges with interpretation. There are um, uh, several assays available that have different cutoffs. Um, and so it's very important to be looking at the algorithms um, that are being used to, to calculate that sensitivity and specificity. Um, and we also need some better diagnostic tests for pathogens as well as the host response. So um, really trying to use these biomarkers in isolation is probably not the right approach. So that brings me to talk a little bit about host response in COVID-19, which I think has been a subject of great interest. Um, so compared to COVID-19, uh, compared to other infections such as influenza, even other seasonal coronaviruses and sepsis, um, we do know that uh, there's a muted immune response that's observed in some patients with COVID-19. Um, and it's postulated that there's a paradoxical downregulation of several key differentially expressed genes. Um, so that the patient is not able to mount uh, an appropriate immune response. At the same time, upregulation of interferon-associated pathways may lead to a very robust response in severe illness, um, which may account for the, the poor outcomes that we're seeing. And so there is some perhaps clues here as to why uh, you know, there are patients that are young and healthy that are still getting extremely ill. One recent study found that SARS-CoV-2 infection has a distinct biosignature that differs between NP swabs and whole blood that might be leveraged for COVID-19 diagnosis. So there are many groups and institutions and diagnostic companies that are working in this space, um, looking at uh, COVID-19 and the distinct biosignatures. I'm just gonna talk briefly about one of the companies I'm most familiar with, which is Inflamatics. Um, so here, um, essentially, uh, there were 21 studies that were conducted in the public domain. They pulled any viral disease other than COVID-19 um, and look, in, they included patients that were mechanically ventilated or admitted to the ICU or even died. Um, and they found that um, six uh, or five genes, individual genes were found to be most predictive. Um, and what they did is they used a machine learning uh, train algorithm on 20 um, of those uh, cohorts. And then they validated what with one to improve, um, uh, to approve the lean one, leave one study out methodology. So you can see here the intended use is basically 
that you would have a tool here that could tell you whether um, your patient was low risk, moderate risk, or high risk, which is not always obvious um, when we're first seeing the patient. And then they basically took um, an overview of this uh, five mRNA signature, and they basically, uh, using bioinformatics and the large data set of patients uh, with these 21 cohorts, um, and then um, discovered that this performed well in terms of the AUROC um, for patients. Um, but the ROCs, as we know, are not so useful in clinical decision-making. Um, so essentially, um, uh, for the low-risk rule-out band, they observed a negative predictive value of 99.7% for the least severe, but the high-risk or rule-in bands had um, low predictive value of 15%, um, and then only 10% fell into the intermediate band. So um, it's, it's more critical that we uh, not rule out disease in patients that may go on to actually develop uh, high risk. So um, it wasn't so critical that the, that the high risk band had a low predictive value. Um, so this is just some of the work um, that's being done currently by one company, but there are, um, as I mentioned, other groups, including the um, ARLG or the Antibacterial Resistance Leadership Group at NIH that's also done a lot of work in this space. There are, however, some implementation challenges uh, to this. So as we all know, many studies have failed to show the desired impact on clinical care and outcomes when looking at diagnostics alone. Um, and that's because we practice in complex healthcare environments that are dynamic. And I um, suspect we still have a major gap between integrating our clinical microbiology and healthcare setting workflows. Um, and we also fail to consider heuristics and uh, you know, our own behavior as physicians. Uh, this was demonstrated in a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, a couple years back, looking at a patient level randomized controlled trial of procalcitonin in 14 United States hospitals. Um, and essentially they uh, provided clinical guidance for the role of PCT in lower respiratory tract infection. They randomized patients to PCT plus uh, some guidance uh, versus usual care and really found no significant difference in antibiotic days between the two groups. And I think this is really a failure of implementation because the patient population they were studying were those patients with lower respiratory tract being admitted to the hospital. So presumably the clinicians had already decided that they needed antibiotics. Um, and then there was not a lot of familiarity um, or trust of the PCT algorithm. So really when thinking about implementing uh, biomarkers and diagnostic tests, we really need to consider our setting and our populations. Um, I just throw the slide up here. Um, I recommend this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, if anybody wants to know how we as ED clinicians think. Um, but I think we'd, we'd all like to think that when we're making clinical decisions, we're very deliberate and reflective and deductive um, and use rules. But in reality, um, our brains try to be efficient. And so um, we make a lot of associative decisions. They're very quick. Um, they're subconscious and they're more experience-based. So this is what we are constantly fighting against with antimicrobial stewardship strategies. So what is the solution here? Um, you know, we can uh, work on quality improvement solutions, have an implementation science approach, um, I think use of behavioral economics can improve test ordering um, and thus support diagnostic stewardship, as well as clinical decision-making in terms of antimicrobials. And by engineering choices and systems, we can really get the biggest bang for the buck here for some of our new tests. And so I'll just close here in summary, um, the role of diagnostics in COVID-19, as we've seen, there are many opportunities and challenges. Um, what we really need to do, as we saw before, is we need to be able to have a standard way of detecting co-infections and applying potential testing strategies. And then of course, these tests should be integrated into the clinical environment, um, aligned with workflow and operations. And um, the future really is pathogen ID plus host response. So I will close with that. Had to cover a lot of ground in a very short time, um, but I will be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Larissa, for this so comprehensive talk on both things, biomarkers and uh, diagnostics. And uh, thank you also for the reference to behavioral economics and thinking fast and slow. I think it's, uh, it's a book we should all uh, read. And uh, Jerome, are there any questions already? Yes, well, I have, I have uh, two questions. Uh, there's still room. So if you have a, a burning question, just put it in the uh, Q&A at the moment. Um, Mark Bota asks a question about uh, the ferritin to procalcitonin ratio. So what is your opinion on the ferritin to procalcitonin ratio? Is it helpful to recognize a bacterial co or super infection? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I've, I've read a little bit about it, but I can't say I have any personal experience with, with using um, that marker. So maybe I'll let one of the, one of the folks who does more inpatient medicine, because we, we don't typically do this in the emergency department. <laughs> 
That's an interesting question. I, I, I myself, we, we, we haven't used it. Uh, uh, we do uh, use um, um, sequential PCTs and, uh, and then look at RISE, but we haven't, we haven't really put it into perspective with other markets. So it's an interesting question, but maybe, uh, Jose, have you been looking at, at these ratios? No, no, we've not, I have not been looking so, I mean, thoroughly, no. Okay. Well, um, another question here about, about, about PCT. If we have a COVID-19 infected patient coming into the ICU and this PCT is less than 0 0.25, would you prescribe antibiotics or should we rely on sequential PCT? So I think this is a question uh, uh, for you, Larissa. If you yeah, no, I think like that in your, in, in your emergency room. That's the perfect question, actually. Um, you know, it's interesting. I would say that most of our um, emergency physicians and our critical care docs you know, are so nervous about COVID-19 that they will just start broad spectrum antibiotics regardless. Um, you know, I think that we are, you know, for the first time in our ED actually sending procalcitonin more frequently. We don't typically do this for lower respiratory tract or, you know, sepsis patients that we're admitting. I think it does provide an opportunity. Um, you know, the data would suggest that if the PCT is that low that you don't, you could hold off on antibiotics and then I would recommend serial PCTs. And if it starts to rise, you know, further investigations will need to be done um, because it could be, again, it could be a bacterial super infection or it might be, um, you know, more of the inflammatory process and, and tissue damage from the lung infection. So, so I would suggest that these patients, at least at the outset, um, we could hold off on antibiotics. Now, now another question I had on this topic is, is that, um, that, that of course, the, uh, there has been a, a quite a change in the, in the treatment that we are giving to patients with COVID now. So patients who are admitted to the ICU, for example, all have already received uh, steroids uh, after obviously the results from the recovery trial. And the second is that obviously we've been starting to give them all tocilizumab. Um, uh, and so do, can you tell us something about what PCT would do uh, un under that? Would that still That's have the same uh, same prediction uh, as, uh, as 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 was depicted in 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 your in your in your presentation? That's a great question. You know, I'm not sure there's any data on that. Certainly, you know, there's been so much progress in the last couple of months, even just in terms of the treatments that we can offer patients with COVID-19. You know, when I when I presented that case vignette of that patient. We did not have monoclonal antibodies available. Now I know the evidence is somewhat equivocal. Um, you know, we weren't using steroids necessarily as routinely. So I think, I think clinicians like want something, you know, to hang their hat on. And so having these other therapies maybe just makes people a little bit more comfortable not starting antibiotics. And I think, I don't know how the PCT will be impacted, but I think if the PCT is low and you have other therapies available, you know, clinicians might have more trust that they can they can wait to start an antibiotic. And actually our hospitalists are generally not starting antibiotics. So I think it's more of a problem in the critical care setting because the patients are so sick and because they've often been sick at home for so long um, or they've been sick on the floor for so long that, um, that it's more of an issue for the more severe illness. But I think for moderate disease, people are more comfortable now not starting antibiotics and just monitoring. Thank you. Okay. Larissa, do you think that Larissa, do you think that in the COVID pandemic, the rate of patients who are admitted with pneumonia, I mean, uh, uh, with pneumonia without antibiotics, has increased in comparison with uh, pre-pandemic? And do you think that we can learn from this in the future? Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I mean, I don't have hard data on this, but I can say anecdotally in our hospital that's certainly the case. I think fewer patients, I think at the beginning, you know, we didn't really know what was going on and you would see, you know, some patchy infiltrates in the chest x-ray and even the patients being discharged home, you know, we're being, um, we're being discharged on, you know, doxycycline or amoxicillin plus doxycycline because it looked more like an atypical pneumonia. Um, I think now, you know, in RED, we actually have a rapid PCR test that comes back in 20 minutes. And because of that, you know, when people see COVID plus the classic chest x-ray, um, if they even get a chest x-ray, right? Because um, we're not getting chest x-rays in everyone, then I think that many are more comfortable not starting antibiotics. I agree. Thank you. I think it's time for us to, yes. to pro you, proceed to progress with our last speaker, who is Professor uh, Celine Pulcini.
She is full professor of infectious diseases at Nancy. She was uh, the previous SGAP chair. And uh, Jerome and I think that she is uh, the best speaker uh, for the next topic. And uh, the mm, COVID-19 has uh, had an impact on antimicrobial stewardship programs since many of us, many of the healthcare professionals in these teams have to be deployed, have been deployed for COVID-19 care. Uh, it's true that we have uh, uh, given our, our expertise for, for this thing and multidisciplinary teams and consensus and whatever, but we have somehow left aside our programs. And on the other hand, um, COVID-19 has driven a lot of changes. Uh, this has been necessity changes, uh, but um, these changes might bring up some good things. So we asked Celine how, uh, why and how COVID-19 experience can, can help us to rebuild uh, our antimicrobial stu uh, stewardship programs. So please Celine, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jeroen and Jose, for inviting me. And I will try to give a, a biased perspective on this question. So my transparency declaration. So I looked at PubMed, uh, as we all do when we are asked to prepare a presentation. And there are very few hits when you look at stewardship and COVID, actually. So that's the main papers I have used, but I've read uh, all, all the papers on, on PubMed and, and I have looked at what happens around me uh, as we all do. So first to warm you up and to get your feedback, I have three questions. So please, William, if you can share the questions. So in your country or practice, what has been the impact of COVID on antimicrobial stewardship activities? First, they have overall improved of, or have been reinforced. No impact, they have been reduced or you don't know. Please vote. And William, I, I let you I let you close after 10 seconds. Okay, so that, that was my impression as well when reading the literature and when uh, observing. So second question. In your country setting, do you have guidelines promoting antibiotic stewardship principles in COVID-19 patients? Yes, and they include telemedicine practices. Yes, but they don't include tele telemedicine practices. No, or you don't know. Okay, so no in half of the cases, uh, and usually they don't include telemedicine practices. Thank you. Last question. What has been the impact of, of COVID on antibiotic use in your country? So I, I've separated primary care from hospitals. So you can choose decrease no impact or increase for both settings, or you don't know. Okay, so. Yeah, increase in the hospitals and uh, both for primary care. Okay, lovely. <laughs> so let's move forward. Uh, so primary results. I think COVID-19 has revealed weak points, uh, not only on health, but on everything. Uh, it illustrates, and that's quite nice when you want to tell a story to policymakers or to, to your hospital administrator, what can happen where, when no treatment exists to treat an infection. So that's the same that would happen with an untreatable multidrug resistant bacterial infection. And as Timothy and everybody, Larissa, was saying, there are threats and opportunities, and we need to mitigate the threats and to use the opportunities to improve our stewardship practices. And for once, I will try to focus on the bright side. So I will try to focus on the opportunities. And I've put on the left the, the Welcome Trust uh, last report that is quite interesting because they ask a, a fundamental question. How will we frame our communication? With, uh, with AMR with regards to the pandemic. Do we use a pandemic framework or you know, um, terminology or not? And actually it's very mixed in this report. It's quite interesting to think about it in terms of communication. So if, if I have to summarize, I think IPC has overall improved, especially in the community thanks to COVID. 
but AMS has been uh, weakened and uh, a, the COVID was very disruptive for AMS and your replies uh, are, are quite consistent with, with my feeling. And we don't know yet what the impact on AMR will be. We'll see, I think this year or next year or the other years to come. I think also COVID is very interesting because it's a real life demonstration of the cost effectiveness of prevention. And you, we can use this real life story actually to convince our policymakers and, and hospital and management. And it also shows very vividly the added value of infection specialists. And we need to build on that to, to look for more resources, for example, or to build our business case for stewardship. I think and I, I see that there is a change of paradigm at political level. I think you all see in your countries that policymakers express interest and talk about health topics at the high, high, highest, highest level. So for example, uh, president's level or very high level in your country. And that's quite new because usually health was kind of a specialized topic. So it's really an opportunity to talk about further health topics in the future. In Europe, for example, there is talks about building a European health union, which is very new. Health was not a very prominent topic on the EU agenda so far. There are lots of talks as well on pandemic preparedness, health security, and AMR is part of that. So we need to reinforce the AMR uh, part, I think. And there are lots of talk about One Health. One Health is really uh, <laughs> the hot topic right now. And of course, AMI is a One Health topic. So, so we can also use that kind of One Health wave. There are also awareness of opportunities for two topics regarding antibiotic shortages. Everybody knows about drug shortages right now, thanks to COVID. So, and I see a momentum to try to, try to tackle this drug shortages issue. And of course, it will also help uh, tackling the antibiotic shortages issue. Regarding innovation, you know, the, the procurement, the joint procurement, think about uh, buying lots of vaccines at international level and lots of mechanisms that were put in place regarding vaccines for COVID will be probably very helpful when we will be talking about incentives and new mechanisms to boost innovation for AMR. I mean about new antibiotics and, and diagnostics and so forth. Everybody has said, and we all know that unnecessary antibiotic use in COVID patients was and is still is very common due to difficult conditions. Everybody has talked about it, Timothy, Larissa. So lots of uncertainty even now, lots of anxiety, very high workload and no curative treatment. Larissa, you said that um, people sometimes prescribe antibiotics because there is nothing else to prescribe actually, even so they know that, that it's not active. And even some infection specialists did not com completely comply with stewardship principles during the crisis. I put that in the past, but that may be also the present. And it's not very good because we are role models. So we influence a lot other other prescribers. So if I see that as a threat, we need to be very vigilant not for these bad habits to last too, for too long. Otherwise, it will be very complicated to go back to a previous situation where we were not so um, lax with antibiotics be, being given to viral infections. But I can also see that as, as an opportunity because I'm pretty sure that we are all working to advocate for stewardship and maybe the viral pneumonia paradigm, paradigm we see with COVID can be useful to uh, reduce unnecessary antibiotic use for flu and other viral infections in the future. At least that's my hope and I think we need to work on it. Guidelines were also issued and promoted. Not everywhere, I have heard that in the US uh, there were no guidelines with a stewardship perspective, but in most countries, uh, your replies show that in half of, of uh, your countries, it was the case. So you had some guidelines with a stewardship principle. Uh, what is good is that these guidelines for COVID were used by a large variety of professionals because everybody was taking care of COVID patients, basically. So everybody was getting used with using guidelines for antibiotic treatment and infection, infection disease management. Usually, but not, not, not always, these guidelines included the diagnostic process because COVID was a new disease. And maybe we need to stick with that, that principle to include the diagnostic process in our guidelines. And I think overall, there was an increased awareness of antimicrobial guidelines and their value for you know, frontline clinicians. 
So there is an opportunity to build on good habits of using good land guidelines and uh, by everybody. Diagnostics, I will go very quickly because Larissa has made the case for diagnostics. There was a dramatic increase in testing and, and biology capacities in all countries, I think, thanks to COVID. So that will be an incredible opportunity for future antimicrobial stewardship activities and also for, for surveillance and maybe almost real-time surveillance thanks to improved capacity in most countries. Telemedicine, I, I don't know for your country, but in France, telemedicine has increased dramatically, which is a good thing in a way, but maybe a threat in another way for stewardship. So there were increased telemedicine between professionals and patients, but also between professionals, a kind of tele-expertise, if I may say that. Um, when you look at the literature, wh when you focus on the professional patient kind of telemedicine, uh, the literature kind of suggests that maybe unnecessary antibiotic use is more frequent when uh, telemedicine is used as compared to face-to-face -to -face traditional consultation. So in France, and that's the only example I, I found, we asked professional societies to write guidance on that. Uh, what they were thinking about telemedicine and stewardship. And actually what they wrote is that in most cases when an antibiotic should be prescribed in the outpatient setting, face-to-face -face consultations are to be preferred rather than telemedicine when uh, you consider initiation of treatments. So I don't know if you have the same in your country, but, but maybe something to work on and, and to look for in research and also to discuss with uh, professional organizations. Technology, we all are very familiar with technology right now. And, and, and that was, I think, a dramatic improvement in our hospitals and in our, our healthcare settings. We all use technology every day right now with virtual meetings, platforms, world rounds, electronic prescribing systems. And I think all that was very useful to improve stewardship and we need to build on it for future activities. Uh, in some countries also, there were some apps for patients, for example, in France, lots of apps with uh, facilitated follow-up, which might be interested in the future to, to improve monitoring of patients. And also some apps or tools to facilitate self-care for self-limiting infections, which is good because uh, when you don't go to see the doctor, usually you are not prescribed an, anti an, an unnecessary an antibiotic. So something to build on, I think. Uh, also, technology has changed the way we teach to, to students, uh, and maybe there is a window of opportunity to improve our stewardship teaching, and I've put here as a reminder the ESCMIT competencies for stewardship that were published in 2019. Self-care has been very changed due to COVID and mostly due to lockdown and, you know, fears of patients to, to go and see uh, doctors and being contaminated. So it was perhaps more common in primary care for self-limiting infections, uh, I think, during the COVID period. And maybe that's something, something we can build on to increase self-care when it's needed, of course, for patients not to see, and, uh, to see a professional and being exposed to unnecessary prescribing, actually. There were also lots of system-wide changes because the COVID pandemic has broken, and broken down barriers, resulting in increased collaboration, which is good. Increased collaboration, I think, between IPC and AMS teams, which is excellent. We need to build synergies here. New members were sometimes involved in AMS because ID specialists, for example, were, were dealing with COVID patients. So, for example, pharmacists, nurses, then and many other professionals were more involved in AMS, which is a good thing as well. Lots of collaboration with, between professionals in the hospitals. Everybody was taking care of COVID, so AMS could reach out to many more professionals in the hospitals. Lots of collaboration between professionals of different settings at local level. I don't know for your country, but in France, lots of collaboration with, with nursing homes, with primary care at local, regional, and even national level. So uh, that's really an opportunity to build and to expand the network for future stewardship activities. Lots of discussion as well between professionals and management with maybe some hospital directors be being more open to, to discussion about you know, prevention, stewardship, and uh, clinical care in general. So that's also an opportunity. Lots of discussion between professionals and, and patients as well. And that's good to empower uh, patients. 
And also, I have the feeling, and I've observed that in France, that uh, regional and national structures were more involved, more active. And so it, it has helped structure each uh, profession or discipline. And so it will facilitate collabor collaboration and communication in the future. So I think we need to build on it and to have an expanded and more structured network for, for stewardship in the, in the future. During COVID and right now, we still uh, share our experiences at all le levels, nationally and internationally. At the beginning, it was really necessary because it was a new disease. So everybody was looking for information and to share you know, experiences. And maybe that, that's something we need to, to keep actually to improve our practices and using the technology I discussed before probably. Communication, so that was good and bad. <laughs> I don't know for your country, but communication was really, really, really uh, messy and intense in France. So I think communication has become everyday practice during COVID for, for almost all professionals. So it has helped better structure uh, our network to, to have new contacts with journalists and media. And so probably it has helped realize that professionals have a societal role to play regarding communication. And maybe we can use these expanded communication uh, for future stewardship related communication and activities. We, Timothy mentioned the, the importance of data and uh, the importance of a framework. I think there is a historic opportunity here to uh, assess the impact of COVID-19 or any pandemic to inform local and a national strategy regarding AMR and AMS. So you, you uh, said that antibiotic use usually was stable or usually increased in hospitals uh, with sometimes an increase in broad spectrum antibiotics. In the community, it was usually stable or it was decreased during, especially during lockdowns, usually for uh, antibiotics uh, prescribed for respiratory diseases in some countries for dentistry, but not in the UK and in some countries for surgical prophylaxis because you know, surg surgeries were canceled. So I think all these data can help us uh, understand uh, the relative drivers of antibiotic use. Was the decrease in the outpatient setting due to um, non-COVID disease transmission, so IPC? Was it due to healthcare access to care seeking or other factors? That's really interesting. And when we, 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 we will have replies actually to these important questions, it will help us uh, design our future strategies to tackle AMR. And also I think these reduction numbers, for example, in France during the first lockdown, antibiotic use in the outpatient setting was reduced by 40%. It also indirectly suggests the magnitude of unnecessary or at least preventable antibiotic use. Assessing the impact will also be necessary to monitor the impact of any harm caused by reduced antimicrobial stewardship activities in, in hospitals or in other settings such as increased antibiotic use or reduction in appropriateness, C. difficile infections, increased in resistance, increase in hospital admission, length of stay, mortality. We need to look at this to build the case for the value actually of stewardship and to try to have further resources to strengthen stewardship activities and to make people realize that uh, in, the future, in a future pandemic, we need to maintain stewardship activities as much as possible because they are necessary during a, a crisis. So uh, it needs to be continued, lots of work, uh, but it's really exciting actually to, this, to see these opportunities. We need to be very vigilant with the threats as well. So I think it's really necessary to kind of plan a debriefing to identify the opportunities and to mitigate the threats. There is time, I think it's a time right now to ask for stewardship resources based on, on data and you know real life experiences uh, in your setting. My feeling at first, it seems that we have lost time for AMS during COVID, but actually I think we may ha have saved time in a way because we will have you know, real, real stories to tell to our, our policymakers and hospital management. And I think that, don't forget that there is a window of opportunity for everything. The momentum won't, won't last. So if you need to do the debriefing not too late, Otherwise, in one year, when people will be out of the crisis, I'm not sure the message will be listened to. That was that were my thoughts about uh, the impact of COVID on security. But I'm very happy to hear your thoughts as well. Thank you very much, Celine, for finding the bright side of this uh, 
so difficult times. And Jerome, you've been looking at, at the questions. Do you have any questions for Celine? Mute. Sorry, sorry. There's one nice question from Beatrice Alonso. Uh, she says, uh, it's just a reflection. In my country, one situation that has seriously impacted in AMS is the collapse of primary health care. So when patients arrive to emergency rooms with COVID, many times antibiotics are prescribed just in case that later, uh, later on, they cannot be followed up properly. So is that something you recognize, Celine? Is, is, have, you, have you heard those signs? Maybe not in France only, but uh, uh, other places? Yes, yes. Uh, as I said, COVID has shown the weak points because it was such a massive surge. You know, um, so yeah, the collapse of primary care or difficulties to organize primary care is, of course, a massive uh, driver for unnecessary antibiotic use. Um, so yeah, yeah, I know it happens in some settings. And... Well, in that same vein, I, I think you, you, you shortly addressed the idea uh, of, of at least providing guidelines on telemedicine practices. Now, I'm very curious, um, uh, what, what are the main recommendations in that guideline? Should we actually accept telemedicine or should we say, no, 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 we want to still see our patients because otherwise we cannot diagnose and then we may be treating, over-treating patients over the phone or over the, over the internet. Yeah, depends on your national context. Uh, in France, for example, you cannot um, you cannot uh, um, ban telemedicine for some clinical situations at regulatory level. I mean, so that that's the reason we went for professional recommendations because that's the prescriber that is in charge of deciding if telecom telemedicine is uh, is adapted to the patient or not. So, so yeah, I think you need to look into your country uh, and you need to, to look right now, in my opinion, because telemedicine will stay after COVID because it's so convenient for national authorities for many, many different reasons. <laughs> so if you don't address the problem right now, I think telemedicine will stay and it will be very, very difficult to go back to, to previous uh, habits and face-to-face uh, -face consultations. So, yeah. Celine, one, one thing that I think we should have learned, uh, at least from the healthcare system perspective, uh, that we, they need to be built with some extra reserve for these pandemic times or any contingency that can happen. Do you think that antimicrobial stewardship teams could be the uh, peacetime corps that can be naturally deployed when a pandemic, but you have to have a good uh, peacetime corp? that uh -huh. can build uh, uh, multidisciplinary teams, guidelines, um, uh, would be a good selling for uh, a strengthening antimicrobial stewardship team to the face of administrations and all that? I think there is a window of opportunity. I completely agree with you there. I think we need to be able to convince uh, you know, policymakers that having stewardship and IPC, of course, in place is mandatory, is a kind of prerequisite when you have a health crisis. And I think it can be done. Uh, I have some ideas for France. Um, so when the crisis come, uh, you, you have prepared actually everything and actually having stewardship and IPC in place prevents a crisis and di di diminishes the, the impact they have on the, on the system. And I think having data to, to kind of demonstrate that will be very helpful. And you need also to, to use your professional organization to do some advocacy. So, so we thank you very much, Celine. We have um, uh, two questions. I think we have, uh, yeah, we, we, might, we might still have time for that. There's one question by Andrew Seaton. Great presentations, clear opportunities for improving MS funding resource. Any comment on post-COVID remobilization and OPAT or COPAT mm -hmm. opportunities? Yeah, I didn't talk about OPAT because it's so diverse in, in you know, in Europe and, and elsewhere. But what COVID has done is that it has usually improved OPAT because it was so convenient during COVID. So yeah, I think there are opportunities here as well to strengthen OPAT and to make the link with, with, with stewardship. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, uh, uh, Kansu Chiman asks, uh, thanks for the presentation. Do you think COVID will change uh, IPC strategies as well as AMS strategies? It was not the topic, but yeah, I'm convinced it, it will. Uh, my hope actually is that hand hygiene will be for everybody 
and you know kind of uh, <laughs> the universal uh, gesture everybody needs to do um, and I hope that we can have, you know, kind of universal uh, infection control uh, measures everywhere, including in the community. And I think that the main change of paradigm with IPC was the focus on the community. I think we have understood that we need to have IPC in the community and for community acquired infections as well, not only for healthcare associated infections. Thank you very much. I think that's a, that's a really nice concluding uh, sentence. Um, so, uh, people, we're coming to the end of this uh, this great uh, webinar, and 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 uh, I'm I'm grateful for you all to be here. Um, concluding, I would say what I have learned, and just some highlights that uh, from Timothy, I've learned that antibiotic use actually is reduced uh, over the time in COVID, over our COVID times in primary care, but it has increased in acute care. And we need to find out a little bit more what are the reasons for that. And um, the second talk taught me that Kappa is out there, uh, but we are still too early to completely understand what the incidence is, what the exact, uh, we, we're, we're, we're missing some diagnostics uh, on, on, on the exact um, uh, uh, and, and the exact prevalence on what it is exactly. And um, well, we've noticed that it, I've learned that the role of serum galactomannan is actually relevant and predicts mor uh, mortality. So those are the takeaways for me. Um, uh, Jose, what are your takeaways from, from the talks you hosted? From Larissa, I've learned that um, both biomarkers and rapid diagnostics, although they're not perfect and they are far from perfect, they can help us to improve antibiotic use. We have to select which ones we're going to use and we have to think on how we are going to implement them. And two couple of things that are very important is to think on the workflow in times of pandemic, thinking of the workflow is essential in order to warrant uh, a good implementation. And also we have to think on how decision-making works in order to improve antimicrobial use and to improve the yield of both biomarkers and rapid diagnostics. And from Zelina, I've learned a lot of positive things that can happen if we do think and reflect on what could have been done better and what can we learn from this, uh, this experience. So um, that's what I've learned. It's a lot what I've learned. And I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to have uh, listened to all you four. Thank you very much for for your, uh, for your presentations that all have had a very high level. So thank you very much. We hope to all meet you at ACMID and uh, live, not like this, hopefully. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we'll make up for what we've missed over the last couple of years. Thank you and good evening. Bye-bye. Good evening. <laughs>